Hello, hello. I promise I'm not the only one that's going to be here <laughs> for our conversation today. We're just having a few technical difficulties, um, but we'll be welcoming other Bank and Yourself professionals here shortly. Um, but I didn't want to make anybody wait any longer and also don't want to make uh, the live algorithms mad at me or anything. So I thought I would jump in here. I'm super excited about today's conversation. Um, we've got a little bit of an outline. You can see it also in the description, some of the questions we're going to ponder today. Um, what I invite you to do is make yourself a home, grab you know a cup of tea, some water, whatever is um, good for you, what you love, and make use of the chat. We want to hear from you as we're talking today. What is your feedback? What questions do you have? How can we make sure we're talking about what you want to hear about? The banking crisis and what's happening there is something a lot of people have questions about. There's a lot of uh, different stories that have been um, out there in the mainstream media. And uh, of course, the stories are continuing to develop. So we don't know, you know, there, um, there's news every day, it feels like almost. So uh, share with us, what do you want to dig into? What do you want to hear our perspectives on? Not being, you know, mainstream media people, we're financial professionals. We've got our own unique take on it and those kind of things. And then, of course, also about the bank on yourself concept, what questions, thoughts, ideas do you want to bring into the conversation? This is meant to be all of us together sharing, conversing, having a lot of fun. So we're going to be welcoming Brandon and Mark here in a few minutes um, or few seconds. We'll see as soon as they're uh, ready, they can let me know. And I also want to welcome you here for the conversation as well. So if you're hearing my voice, I want to see you in the comments, say hi, ask a question, uh, jump in and let's get Mark in here too. Let's maybe move it. things around a little bit. There we go. Um, get settle in. We're going to have a lot of fun. We are live, obviously. <laughs> um, so welcome, Mark. Welcome, Brandon. Thank God you're here. Yeah. Glad to be yeah. here. Thank you. I would say a lot has happened since we did our last live. We did it a couple weeks, a month ago, actually, because uh, life has been a little busy for all of us. Uh, we are trying to do it on the regular on the uh, every end of last Friday of the month. Uh, however, uh, the last Friday of the month has been a little hectic for all of us. While we had to go on a little hiatus, it seemed like the world went crazy and we had a lot to talk about that we just couldn't talk about because we were too busy trying to help people. It's, it's true. Yeah, there's. Uh, it's a, sort of like the idea whose time has come and nothing can stop one of those ideas as it's uh, just coming down the mountain. And the, I think the intense pressure uh, on the banking sector, we're going to be talking about that. The uh, unbelievable cracks in the foundation of the economy, we're going to be talking about that. And most importantly, what you can do about it to not just protect yourself, but thrive in these circumstances to give you the very best financial future you can count on in the months and years ahead. Yeah. Well, and I, I got to say, I'm getting a lot of people who are worried. Uh, maybe that's why our calendar is so booked up uh, and asking me this question, hence why we created this or why we're doing this video. So mm -hmm. uh, anyway, lots yeah, of questions about this. Yeah. I'd, can we start with some stories of when, you know, take us back or we'll take ourselves back to when the news was breaking about Silicon Valley Bank and that weekend. I don't remember the exact day. It was like late February, early March. Um, and how, what that initial experience was like. I don't know about you two, but I wasn't surprised knowing the history of banking and how we've been here before and the cycles that repeat. It was like, yep, we knew this was coming. Do you guys have that same kind of feeling? Yeah, I, I, I know I did. Really didn't think the um, I I didn't think the the collapse of a bank was going to have that much of a ripple effect, uh, mainly because maybe we cut our teeth in the two thousand eight crisis and we were pretty used to you and me seeing uh, banks just falling over like dead leaves at, at the end of fall. 
but this was a not just a typical run run of the mill mom and pop bank. This is apparently a fairly large bank. Uh, and what was so interesting was it was it was um, it was capped at the two hundred and fifty thousand dollar federal deposit insurance corporation limit, mm -hmm. like we're all familiar with, uh, which uh, coincidentally was raised in two thousand eight from a hundred thousand to two fifty. But but anyway, the the depositors were supposedly made whole uh, as a result of this collapse of the Silicon Valley Bank, uh, even beyond the $250,000 limit. So nobody lost a penny. And, and yet we're, we're, I guess, supposedly told that it was not a taxpayer bailout. Now, where does the money come from? Well, you know, the FDIC Insurance Corporation yeah. is where it comes from. Uh, and what, where does that money come from? Well, it comes from banks paying a premium into FDIC to be considered a member of FDIC insurance. They're having to pay a premium. So when when banks are, you know, uh, gobbling up the FDIC coffers, what do typically insurance companies have to do if they have not enough money on reserve? They have to raise premiums, right? Yeah. You know, if your auto insurance, if, if too many people are getting in auto accidents or if there's a big flood in Florida or something, they're going to have to raise the premiums to refill those coffers uh, to cover the potential loss of the next bank. So where do you think all of those premiums are coming from? Banks aren't just made of money. I know it looks like they are, but where are they going to get the money? Well, they're going to get it by lowering the interest on our savings accounts or raising the interest on our you know, on our loans, our credit cards, our lines of credit. So who actually is paying for the Silicon Valley bailout? Anybody want to take a guess? The banks sure aren't. Good guess. Great. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So who does that leave? Right. 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 <laughs> um, the suckers are holding the bag. Yeah. yeah the Americans. Yeah. So. And I don't want to skip over that first weekend. When the news came out on Friday that Silicon Valley Bank was closing, and yet we didn't find out until Monday, right, that the FDIC in, in, uh, was stepping in and what they were going to be doing. I remember getting an email from our payroll service that was like, if you have payroll in transit right now, do not worry, right? Money's still moving. Um, we, we didn't use Silicon Valley Bank. I don't think our payroll service does but they were worried about their customers who had just run payroll on Friday for their, or, you know, like maybe payroll was supposed to be deposited on Friday and they were like trying to get ahead of it. And that was a lot, that was stressful. I actually have a good I, a person I know that uh, works at a startup and they bank at Silicon Valley bank. And she was in charge of making sure payroll went through and yeah. She, wow. we, she could not meet with me that weekend. She was like, I'm, I'm scrambling to figure this out. That, that takes a toll on us. Forget about money for a second. That impacts our stress levels, right? How, how we experience life to be in that. And, um, I have another person, a banker at a different bank, um, works, you know, for that bank that was running fire drills all weekend. Like, what, what do we do? Does, how is this going to impact us? And th so those ripples were like starting right away and they're still continuing today. So even if we don't pay for it with low, you know, lower interest rates on our savings accounts or higher interest rates on our loans, we're paying for it with our stress levels and our emotions. And it's not just people that are directly involved, but all the ripple effects from there too. Anything y'all want to speak to on that side of things as well? I mean, I think uh, knowing the ripple effects uh, emotionally and also what we've thought was stable. And, you know, I mean, literally when people come to us, they're like, is it FDIC and what does that actually mean? And blah, blah, blah. And and just knowing that people are uh, a bit scared, rightly so, because they were told well, if you do this, this will be safe. This will be good. And then as I was listening to the um, breakdown of some of this, uh, this is something that I heard from, I think it was called Capital Isn't. Something that they they said in there was somehow the bank um, started collapsing because uh, intelligent investors or sophisticated investors, that's what they said. Sophisticated investors learned about certain things and they started uh, pulling out their funds. And what that tells me 
was sophisticated investors uh, caused the banking crisis. So banks really want us to be stupid because if we had not been sophisticated, you know what I'm saying? I'm like, oh, this seems a little interesting and in and it's wanting us to kind of be unaware of what's really going on. And the more we become aware, it affects our mental health, emotional health and other things. Yeah, Amanda, I'd say too, you're right. I think the, un the unknowing of what was going to happen uh, and what will happen, I think, brings a great deal of stress and anxiety. I hear it in people's um, stories. I was talking to a couple before the banking crisis of 2023. Uh, I was uh, talking to a couple. They were relating back to a credit union that they had worked with for 20 plus years. So this is the exact opposite of a big mm -hmm. systemically important bank. This is a small credit union. They had worked with this credit union for 20 plus years, almost 25 years. And they had never missed a payment. They'd always been great banking bankers there. You know, they'd always uh, had their uh, savings accounts there. And then as they're moving across country, one time they overdrafted on their bank account and it caused some sort of problem for them. And it, she said it was like moving heaven and earth to try to get the fees reversed and things fixed up. So after 25 years of having a great relationship with the bank, having all their accounts there, one little mistake on their, as they're moving across the country, sure, I might overdraft if I'm not paying close attention while I'm moving across country and the bank can't make that one, you know, waive one fee, right? She said that banking should be like a relationship back and forth, being able to forgive one another when necessary. Right. And when banks, even smallish banks uh, are faced with, you know, being, a friendly bank versus profits it too often they choose the latter they choose taking a profit pulling the rug out from under us and this is not un uncommon for us to see i don't know i'd love to hear you guys and your thoughts here but it's not uncommon to see how how banks are really taking advantage uh, of people in these sort of situations yeah. i think of a story of a, a really good friend of mine who's an immigrant and had a bank account at a large international bank right here in the U.S. that's based here in the U.S. And she just got a notice one day, we're closing your account. And like, that was it. She had to figure it out, like figure out what to do um, and what that was going to look like for her. And that, that was scary, right? It's like they can do that. Hmm. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, I think that goes to even... I don't know why that person had their account closed. She couldn't figure it out it's either. A reminder. Yeah. Well, it's a reminder that if banks just wake up on the wrong side of the economy one day, they can decide to kick us out of their, it's their world. We're just living in it. You know, if, if we, you know, maybe we don't uh, look like them, sound like them, believe what they believe, whatever, yeah. if we don't have the right, you know, um, you know, uh, credentials, in our accounts, if we're not doing the right things, dancing to their tune, they are the ones with the umbrellas. When it, when it starts to rain, they tend to want them back. Yeah. Uh, as Mark Twain says, you know, a banker is a fellow who will lend you his umbrella when the sun shines, but wants it back as soon as it starts to rain. And so whether it's the loans that they're taking back from us or the account itself, our savings and checking and all that, uh, it's a reminder, once again, that it's their world. We're just living in it. Yeah. I think, again, uh, as you guys are here, put comments in here if you have questions. I can't guarantee we know because we are not uh, the Federal Reserve, which, you know, manipulates things, maybe. Uh, or, you know, Jamie Dimon or any of those people. Uh, but we can give some of our opinions and what we see on the regular uh, so if you have questions or, or concerns or, or uh, amens, put them in the comments because uh, we'd love to hear. The, the, the thing I just, again, go back to is, you know, this is something that we thought was uh, central to us. It's like important to us. You know, even we have a, a five-year-old uh, and Amanda and I were like uh, just thinking about, oh, yeah, he has enough money. Do we put put the money in the bank um, because that's you know, what we're, we're uh, taught to do. Right. Or the Mary Poppins thing. And, and 
uh, is there any other way is, is something I think about. Is there a, a better way to, is it better to put it under a mattress? Um, is more bank collapses coming? Uh, where do you think this is all leading to? Cause you know, it's died down a little bit. I mean, again, it's, that was two months ago and we, uh, now it's old news, but, but where do you think this is leading Mark or Amanda? Well, you know, I, I'd, I'd love to just mention that we are not out of the woods yet with regard to banks and you guys might know this, but uh, I was doing some research and apparently FDIC only has one 1.2% of all of our deposits on reserve and they just spent it. They just spent it. So it's mostly empty now. So we're down to almost no, no reserve at the FDIC. Where do they spend it? They spent it on Silicon Valley and the other guys that just toppled over. So again, they're refueling the tank right now as we speak with premiums from the banks. But even before, they only had 1.2% of all of our $22 trillion in bank savings and deposits in this country. Does that make you feel safe to think that FDIC could only handle 1% of the bank's failure? Okay, so in the Great Depression, almost half the banks went bankrupt. And in 2008, almost 10% went bankrupt. Yeah. So if 2008 happened again this year, FDIC would not be around anymore. And that's a surprising fact for a lot of people to realize. Uh, I'll also mention this quickly that, you know, if, if you count all the assets that banks hold to market, if you were to price all of their assets, not to book value, but to market value, which I'll explain what that is in a minute, half, half of all banks would be insolvent. If you just looked at their assets according to market value, what is market value? It's the real value, okay? So let's say you wanted to buy a brand new car. That would be called, you know, a, a new purchase. So brand new MSRP, you know, buy it from the dealer, whatever it is, 50 grand, let's say for a brand new nice car. Yeah. That's the book value of that vehicle. So when you buy it off the lot, it's book value. It's brand stankin' new. And then let's say I drive my car around for two or three years. Now I'm going to sell it to Amanda. Amanda, are you going to buy it from me for 50000 Probably not, right? There's depreciation. It smells like French fries in there. Okay, guilty as charged. Now you've got a market value of maybe $25,000, let's say. So banks are allowed to run their businesses with assets at book valuations, okay? Even though they've got all these half spent bonds and everything else they, and real estate that's depreciating and, and more, um, they've got assets that are tied to book valuations so that they look better on paper, mm -hmm. but their market values on all their assets are actually about uh, much, much lower in value. And this, when you do all the math on this, roughly 2,000, meaning almost half of all banks would be considered insolvent if we were to just value all their stuff according to what they could sell it for on the open market today. Now, to me, this says red light, red light, pay attention, pay attention. You know, the bank is not the safest place to park our cash. And uh, so this is sort of what's, what we see. When I see, the, when I see the market as it is today, that's sort of what I see. I don't think about my bank as a safe place. I don't care if you've got a mega bank or a micro bank. Um, unfortunately, we've got, you know, I think poor methodologies for valuations. Yeah. And then at some point, Amanda, I'd love for you to share at some point about what is fractional reserve banking and how does that fit into this whole yeah, picture? But, but, you know, maybe you have other things yeah, to say. Before we get too. there, I, um, I want to, I love what you just shared. I listened to the podcast episode on the Not Your Average Financial Podcast that came out today. Um, heard a lot oh, of yeah. that same things in there. I recommend everybody go listen to that. As, um, even uh, more awesome stuff if you liked what you're hearing there. And because we're on YouTube and we're live, I can actually share my screen and show people a little bit of what, um, how I would and how I would share what you just said and maybe a little bit different of a way. Um, so it. I'm going to share. And then the, the big thing to know here, and you'll see this when we look at it. Um, I, I was blown away when I, when I first learned years ago that when you look at a bank's balance sheet, that what are, you know, there's the assets and the liabilities, the assets are the loans 
the liabilities are the savings and checking account. From the bank's perspective, your money there is a liability to them. Your loan is their asset. So keep that in mind mm -hmm. as we go here, because that's a really big um, uh, thing here. And Les is confirming that in the chat too. If you're um, catching that, I want you to to know that that's there. So here's um, can before I before you go in that, I just want to say I believe one of the when we talk about boutique banks and and big banks, I believe one of them that went under was like not a small bank. Yeah, that were that, none of them were, were really. That. Yeah, that they weren't small banks. Um, so here is uh, the FDIC's website, and here's these numbers that Mark was just sharing about their um, deposit insurance fund, and their balance increased in Q4 of 2022, but here's that reserve ratio, 1.27, um, which was up one basis point. If you're not familiar with that kind of financial language, that means up a tenth of a percent. <laughs> That's not very big. Amanda, do you mind scrolling oh, up on my side? We We're kind of covering up that. some of that stuff yeah. with our videos. There you go. Mm -hmm. So it's right there, um, FDIC's website. You can see. Um, so you're saying this is not tinfoil hat stuff. Yeah, is that exactly. What you're here, it's right from them. Their Q Q1 for 2023 report mm -hmm. is going live on May 31st. So next week, it's going to be... Um, it's going to be live on YouTube when they release it. Uh, I'll uh, try to remember to put that link in the ch in the show notes in case you want to get reminded and see when they bring out their Q3, Q1 for 2023 report, because I will be interested to see how those numbers changed. Um, but then, so they have a bunch of press releases too. I found it very interesting. This press release that they did March 26th where they um, are digging into what they did with Silicon Valley Bank and uh, so forth. And they're sharing how on March 10th, they how much assets and deposits they have. Remember, assets are the debts that were owed to Silicon Valley Bank. And then deposits are their liabilities. And they um, sold them at a discount of $16.5 um, and so if we go back to those other numbers, right, they had uh, $128 billion. They took mm. on the, at the liabilities, right, the, the deposits at Silicon Valley Bank without regard to um, the $250,000 FDIC insurance limit. And then they sold those deposits, those liabilities, to um, other banks, right? There's the list of them somewhere here. Uh, or on a different press release, and they sold them at a discount. So they're like immediately, like the balance would have gone from, if I'm interpreting this correctly, the balance would have gone down immediately in their deposit insurance because they were, you know, um, they were taking on those liabilities. But then they sold those liabilities to the other banks that would take them on, you know, now those deposits are at those, uh, those banks. But they gave them a big discount to take on those liabilities of $16.5 billion of, dis of a discount, which is now they're going to, if we read this in more um, detail, it's going to, a, a loss share transaction, um, they're going to, uh, like Mark was sharing, take, do a, a premium increase from the other banks to make up for that $16.5 billion uh, of a discount that they gave. So I um, wanted to share that. I look, I really look forward to the Q1 2023 report when it comes out because I want to see how did these numbers change? Is it still 1.27? Is it more? Is it less? Right. In terms of the percentage there and comparing that um, because I think that'll be really interesting to see like post all of that what's happened. And then what does that set us up for Q2, Q3, Q4 of this year as well? Well, you guys know, I mean, we're all um, fairly exposed and, and, uh, researched up and experts on something called insurance yeah. around here. Uh, and what does FDIC stand for? Oh yeah. Federal deposit, what insurance corporation. So it sounds like a private entity corporation, right? There's insurance in the name. So, um, we'll get to how we might reinterpret this idea of insurance here shortly, but I just want to mention that, that the FDIC is supposed to be an insurance solution 
to a problem. So, you know, insurance typically covers a loss. What's the loss? Oh yeah, bank failure. So go back about a hundred years in 1933 and that's when the FDIC was founded in the middle of the Great uh, Depression. And it happened, of course, after the problems, uh, you know, usually the results of, you know, uh, new interventions are typically after the problem has happened. Um, but, you know, it's it's supposedly been there for the last hundred years to give you a feeling of safety when you bring your money to the bank. You know that even if that bank fools around with wrong loans and does, you know, risky bets with their with their with your deposit, that you can still be made whole through this thing called the FDIC. OK, so my question is. How did banks exist for thousands and thousands of years before an FDIC? What would you do? Like if there was no FDIC, let's let's imagine a world for a minute, guys, where there's no FDIC and you do need banking in your life without, and let's not get into bank on yourself just yet. What would you do with your green stuff um, to keep it safe? And And what would you, maybe, would you investigate the bank's balance sheet a little better maybe? Would you possibly do a little review or, or maybe there'd be a Yelp page for banks? You know, there is no, you know, safety. I don't know of any, I didn't do any research when I opened up my checking account here in town. I just grabbed the nearest one that's got the bank branch close to us and I'm off to the races, you know? What do you guys think? What would you do if there was no FDIC? What would you do to choose your bank? Go ahead, Brandon. I was talking a lot there for a minute. I would probably ask Amanda, what would we do? Uh, no, I, I do think about sometimes checking interest rates. What's the interest rate on it? Uh, how much am I going to make? Which is like, oh, it's now 0.3 something percent or something like that for savings uh, and access and, and all that. Usually it's for convenience, which is really interesting. Uh, keep it in the sock. That's what Olivia says. Um Love that, Olivia. That's a great answer. <laughs> Usually at this point, it's like, oh, uh, what is the biggest one? Which is uh, what, I, what I'm thinking about a lot is these, these bigger banks are buying big other banks at a, at a discount. Well, really, maybe uh, as I look for a bank is can I use it in somewhere else in another state and be OK without being paid fees? which sounds awesome, maybe, uh, that I have convenience um, and all of that. But I wonder if there's ulterior motives on their end or is it too big to fail because it gets too big? I don't know. Yeah, I would definitely be checking the reserves of the bank to see how much do they keep, how much are they required to. And that's where we get into the whole fractional reserve banking, which has not always been allowed right? Um, but is now allowed. And when I like what happens to the dollar I put in the bank and the bank can then lend out 90 cents of that dollar, if not more, depending on the size of the bank. Um, and then the person that gets the 90 cents then goes deposit in a different bank and that bank's able to lend out 90% of that, which is like 80 cents or whatever. And and now that my dollar is already, you know, just with two banks turned into a lot more. Um, it's more than uh, it ends up doubling if you take it all the way out to all the people changing hands and moving it around. And that's mm -hmm. that's um, scary. And um, the reserve requirements do change over time. Um, have you ever heard of the Basel Accords? Do you know that one? That's ringing a bell. Tell, give me a bit more context. Yeah. Tell us more. So after 2008, the uh, people get together uh, around the world and they adopt the Basel Accords, and especially because of what happened with Lehman Brothers in particular. And it's all about the reserves that banks have. There's tier one reserves. That's their safest assets. Tier two reserves. And then what the Basel Accords did was say. Tier three reserves are now outlawed. You cannot have tier three reserves. That was a change after the Great Recession and uh, when the, these accords um, came into a, a, a effect. But what I found really interesting when I was, I, there was a big news article that probably everybody missed back in June of 2022 that the hundred or the top thousand world banks 
that their tier one capital hit $10 trillion for the first time ever. Huge amount of tier one capital. That might get us excited, wow. right? Um, yeah. And the um, in the U.S., if you look at where is that tier one capital, about 25% of U.S. banks keep their tier one capital in one very specific place, bank-owned life insurance. Yeah. Well, and that's the latest I found. The latest number I could find wow. was $182.2 billion as of September mm -hmm. 2020 in bank-owned life insurance as part of that tier one capital. That's incredible. But remind me, how much does FDIC right, have? Right, I know. <laughs> Let me buffers? go back to that and get you the specific number. That's 128. Just, that's just cool. 0.2. So the life insurance cash values exceed the FDIC insurance and the banks are using it as their own form of like tier one safe money capital. Yeah. That's that's a connection I'd never made before. And the, so the larger the bank, the according to the reports that I was finding, the larger the bank, the more of their tier one reserves are in bank on life insurance. Mm, wow. Yeah, no, it's uh, it's true, and including Bank of America. There's a statistic that shows that as recently as just a year or two ago, when I was doing some research on this, Bank of America's cash value life insurance cash value is worth more than all of the real estate that Bank of America owns combined. So given that fact, why don't we know about that? And why are, is that not something that we are encouraged to explore and look into for ourselves as Americans? Mm -hmm. If it's good enough for mega banks, uh, so much so that they've got more combined cash in their policies cash value than they have on reserve at the FDIC, the other bank insurance is bank-owned life insurance. So guys, maybe for those, would, would now be a good time to sort of explore what is bank on yourself? How does it fit in with the banking crisis? And maybe talk through the implications. Let's do it. There. Yeah. I mean, yeah, let's go there. All right, cool. So I think the the I'll do kind of the primer for folks who just maybe don't know what it is at all, and then I'll pass the ball to you guys. Uh, so life insurance is a weird thing to be talking about after we just got done talking about the banking crisis that we might be going through. Maybe it's the end of the book. Maybe it's the first page of this banking crisis. We don't know yet. No one knows. Uh, however, life insurance companies have made it through this recent crisis. I haven't seen any news articles on bankrupt life insurance companies. In fact, if there was ever going to be a bankrupt, like a, a bankrupt crisis for life insurance, don't you think it should have been right after a worldwide pandemic? <laughs> like right after the pandemic. And then we get into this financial mess that we're in right now in 2023. Seems like now would be the time to be hearing about life insurance companies going belly up, but I'm not hearing at least any, I'm not hearing any. If there are, there, maybe there's one or two that I've not heard of, but it's certainly not showing up in the news, right? So what is life insurance and how does it fit in? Well, for a lot of people, it's news to hear that you can pour wealth into a contract. And that maybe sounds like buying a house. You can buy a house and pay your house off and you've got wealth in your house. Well, you have a contract with that wealth, meaning you have the deed to the house, for example. You can do the same with insurance contracts. Not all, like I can't build wealth with my auto policy, let's say, or my fire insurance or my health insurance, let's say, but you can build wealth with life insurance contracts. And if it's a cash value life insurance policy, uh, we love dividend paying whole life insurance as a chassis, to, as a contract to build wealth. You're able to not just have a death benefit, but you're able to have a living benefit as well. We call that the cash value. That cash value can be uh, a, a source of liquid money that you can access for any reason, any reason, in good times or bad. So it's liquid and accessible. Usually there's some significant tax advantages to accessing that money too. It could even be tax-free if it's designed properly. Next, it grows on a guaranteed basis. That cash value grows every single year, even this year. And we'll be hitting another all-time record high with all of our policies this year. No matter what's going on in the markets, real estate, banking markets, bond markets, stock market, it just grows. 
and just uninterrupted, right? Compound growth. And it's a linear, as Les would love to probably hear us say, it's a it's non-volatile. You know, there's no volatility there. It's a linear projected growth every single year for the rest of our life. And one last thing, we can use it like a bank. It's not an FDIC insured bank, thank God. Uh, and we can borrow against it and use it like a bank for anything we might need, any big purchases. I just got off the phone with someone before this, this uh, live and we were working on helping him buy another duplex with his policies cash because he didn't want to use his HELOC which was going to charge him 10% on a home equity line of credit, 10% on a HELOC. And then, of course, with a HELOC, the bank would be in control. None of that's necessary. When you have a bank on your self-designed policy, you can borrow against the policy and go buy your duplex or your car or whatever. And the co- and the policy will continue to earn interest as if you had never touched the money, giving us two places for our money to work at the same time. So, I'd love to kind of let you guys take the ball and just sort of unpack some of those or how does that relate to the banking situation we find ourselves in? So there's there's one big aha moment I've had over the last few months with the banking crisis when I learned about how the FDIC could be could raise their premiums basically or like take an extra premium. It's like if I'm a banker when I buy a life insurance contract, a whole life insurance contract that builds a cash value, can the life insurance company change my premiums? No, they can't it, unless they ask my permission and I give it, right? And so like if I'm a banker looking at do I buy more bank in yourself type whole life insurance that builds a cash value or do I tell the FDIC that they should raise my premium so that there's more coverage there to back me up? I'm going to I'm going to choose the one that I have more control over. That's a unilateral contract that can't be changed on me no matter what Congress or, you know, the commissioner of a a, a government agency decides to do. That's that's pretty cool. I mean, I, cool. I never like thought of it until I saw, oh, wait, the FDIC can just say we're going to charge you an extra premium. Yeah, it's so true. Yeah, you you think about it like what I love about that, Amanda, is you're thinking like a banker. And given that, you know, I'll give a shout out to Sari Ibrahim and his podcast, Thinking Like a Bank. Uh, but you've got you've got that mindset to think, all right, well, how does the bank how does the bank perceive what's going on right now? And if I'm seeing a world where banks are going to be uh, under struggle and under duress, and I want to take up market share and be the best banker I can be. You know, I need a lot of liquid access to cash as a bank so I can maybe be be doing what JP Morgan and Chase did when they bought up big shares from some of these recently defunct banks. You know, so how do they do that? Well, I don't know exactly, but I know that they had to have some cash available to make the purchase, at least in part. And I bet at some point somebody had to say, let's let's grab some of that cash out of our policies, our, our hundred billion dollars in cash value in these different policies. I'm betting some of that was at Chase and they made the decision to use that as part of the purchase for these, you know, these uh, assets that they gobbled up uh, from these different banks. So I was also thinking like, you know, it wasn't that long ago when we had a a virus that went after a lot of us. And uh, at the same time, the interest rates and the HELOCs and everything was really low. And there was this this drive, right? People were like doing refinances left and right, um, and the interest rates were were low back in back in the day, way way back two years ago. Um, and now you just told me a HELOC is at 10 percent. Is that what I heard? Um, yeah. This is like this would have been unheard of two years ago. Right. And now it, right. it's mm-hmm. it's a regular occurrence and people were doing the same things with their things saying, hey, uh, how do we uh, still do the, the results, get the results we want? Right. Because um, because they were doing the game two years ago right, with with the HELOC. Now it's getting a little harder. Right. It's, it's getting more and more difficult. And the interest rates mm-hmm. are higher, 10 percent. Uh, this seems a bit uh, interesting and suspect to me that maybe there is 
something happening and they're a little worried and that's why the interest rates uh, seem to be creeping up. Uh, it seems to not be creeping up slowly either. I, d I don't know. So we have a, uh, a, this same gentleman was considering, should I get this next duplex rental property with my HELOC or should I use my policy? What would you say to that, Amanda? What are the benefits, advantages? Les has some comments about HELOCs as well. Yeah, I'm going to so show this. How would you answer? <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, so yes, totally callable. The bank gets in trouble. They can be like, we're closing your line of credit. You owe us the balance right now. If they don't do that, they can um, instead just say, we're going to lower your limit. So now you were going to pay for this next thing or do this improvement with it. Now you can't because that's gone. Uh, lots of control there. Um, a lot of uh, HELOCs are interest only for the payment, but that's still a requirement. You miss that, you're going to get a pretty big fee. Um, compare that, right, with the policy lens from banking yourself type whole life insurance policies where the, the you're an owner of the company. We use mutual companies, so you can re make loan repayments or not, right? It's up to you. You can... Um, we always recommend doing that. Take whenever you take a loan, have a plan to pay it back, whether it's monthly or at the end of three years or you know whatever it might be. Good to do that, but not required. And then I, one of the things I love is as we've seen interest rates changing a lot, just in the banking side of things with policy loans, there they cannot change that quickly. It cannot like it can't be like all of a sudden tomorrow you're going to go from five percent to ten percent, and then also the way that it's calculated, it's simple interest rather than compound interest, right? There's there's all these amazing things, and the difference between the simple and compound can be really big. A five, mm -hmm. you're trying to do apples to apples comparison, a compound interest uh, versus a simple interest. The simple interest, if you're taking a loan, paying it back over five years, might be more. A 5% simple interest looks more like a 3% compounding interest. Uh, that's a pretty big difference. Um, so then if you're going from 5 to 10% compound, that's a big jump. But even the simple interest can't do that. They can only adjust it by small increments. The increment can change depending on your state, those kind of things. So, uh, But it's still really small. It, is this a, a time where I would be able to share my oh, yes. screen and walk through what you just said in such... I mean, that was well said, and it, and it it bears repeating the importance of what you just said, Amanda, it. and the capacity for, and if I share my screen, um, I hope I don't break something here, but uh, what, what I think I'd like to make sure everyone realizes is this is available to us today. You can, you can have, you can do this today. You can opt out of the banking misery that has happened slash will happen slash will always happen because banks have done this for thousands of years. But one by one, family by family, each of us can choose to opt out with the vast majority of your wealth out of the banking system. Sure, I still have a checking account, whatever, but it's not where I keep anything that I could consider like real wealth. You know, it's, it's for convenience. We get to use banks for our convenience rather than let the banks use us for their convenience. So let me share my screen and walk through an example of how these work in practice and how you can do your be your own federal reserve, your personal reserve, okay? Uh, so let's see if I share screen here. Uh, I think I can pull up the entire screen over here, and there we are, okay. All right, let's buy a car. And you might need to move my uh, our videos at some point here for some of this, Amanda, because uh, part of my presentation is gonna cover that up, I think, a little bit, we shall see. So let's say that we want to buy a car and guys, I got to tell you, this is going to be terrible art, but you're going to have to deal with it because that's as good as it gets for this guy. So that's our $50,000 vehicle. And what are some ways we can buy a car? Well, one option is we borrow from the bank. There's our friendly banker right there and he lends us 50 grand. And what do we do next, Amanda? What happens 30 days after we get a loan? Oh, we got to start paying it back. And they that's start right. charging exactly. the interest. Exactly. Yeah. They start throwing interest. We have to throw interest in their pocket. Who gets to retire off that money? You or the bank? We'll leave, we'll leave that as a hypothetical. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Good question. It's not in our pocket anymore. That's for sure. 
So I don't like that option. What's the next option? Well, I can save, 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 save in a savings account and feel great for about 50. I call this a, the sugar high of finance because you climb up that mountain, you feel so high, you feel so great. And then when, when, when it comes time to buy that car, what do we do? We have to withdraw that money out. And now we're down crashing down the sugar crash. We feel that empty feeling in our in our savings account. And the the sticker price on this vehicle might say 50,000, but we all know that the true cost of that car is whatever 50 grand would have earned for us had we not you know, um, bought that car and just left that money invest instead. So we keep breaking compound growth when we pay cash for things. This is why I'm not going to go along with Dave Ramsey's Pied Piper tune that paying cash is the answer. It's not. You're financing it from your future self. You're stealing it from your future self. I would rather pay interest to another banker than steal from my future self by paying cash for things. But I'd rather do neither of those things because there's a better way, right? We can use our policies. This is a picture of a life insurance policy. And I know, I know my art skills are unparalleled here, <laughs> but uh, the, there are two piles of money. There's the cash value, which we've talked about today. And there's the death benefit. Let's say, for example, that our cash value is $50,000 available to borrow. And we have 500,000 in death benefit at this time. Okay. Let me pull over for a minute. Anybody want to make a comment or question? You're doing great, Mark. I love your okay. your drawing okay. skills. They're better than mine. Oh, well, way thank better you. than mine. Talk to my seven year old. <laughs> seven year old could uh, beat us all, all of us, I guess. Then, <laughs> uh, now when we want to borrow money, we can you know withdraw it from our policy. But I'd much prefer to borrow against another asset and use my cash value as collateral. So this other asset is the life insurance general account. We'll call it the pool. And then generally speaking, when you request a loan from the life insurance company, Brandon, how, how long does it take to get that money from the life insurance company and into your pocket so you can pay cash for the car? How, how long typically? Oh, I'd say five to 10 business days um, at most. Mm -hmm. All right. So pretty quick. We're not talking 15 seconds like your savings account. So again, you want to keep some money in quick cash. I uh, like... Um, Olivia's comment. I hope that's a very big sock, Olivia. Keep all that money in that big sock that you have. But some of it should stay in the regular banks. But you know, again, within five to 10 business days, you've got liquid access to your policy. So very liquid. Next, what happens if I did this yesterday and died today? Uh, well, my family would get the brand new car. Way to go, family. <laughs> and my family would get the 500,000 minus the loan balance. So 450, basically. This means because that death benefit is there, and, and this is why we're using life insurance, okay? Because it's life insurance, there's no urgent requirement to repay some sort of loan off this policy. They know, the insurance company knows that we are good for it because we're all going to graduate someday. So we get to decide, because of that fact, we get to determine our own repayment schedule. We are in control over if and when we repay this loan to the policy that we control. All right, so next you mentioned, oh, Can by the way, where did that money go? Is it gone or is it still in there growing, Amanda? Yeah, it's still in there growing. And um, one of the things I loved about your podcast episode today was the great reminder of the reserve that is that pool and how much the life insurance company has to keep available so that if I do want to take that loan, I don't have to worry about there's been a run on the life insurance company. Is that money going to be available? I think you said 114% mm -hmm. is the typical reserve right. requirement. That means of the cash available, they have like that everyone could be loaning from their policies. They have that and more. Can you speak to mm, that? Am I right. remembering but, that correctly? Well, that that's exactly right. Yeah, great memory. And yeah, that literally means that life insurance companies are 10 times, more than 10 times more reserved, more safe than your typical bank. So, so let that sink in, 10 times safer. Can I ask this? So so one of the things that I know this, this will come up is Dave Ramsey loves to say, well, that was your money. They're just doing this and, and blah, blah, blah. And how evil those yeah. insurance companies are. 
because look at that. You just paid interest on your own money. Yeah. And, and I've heard that many, many times uh, and people saying, well, what's, what's that? And how is this different than the HELOC strategy and people using that? Cause it, you just pay, bought the house, right? You paid equity into the house. So what's the difference between this yep. and the HELOC strategy that people love to talk about? and using the X at um, liquidity of your house or whatever. kind. Well, of let's walk through the rest of this. Uh, and you tell me guys how this beats or doesn't beat other options like paying cash or borrowing from your home equity line of credit and more. Um, we do see that the asset is still there. The cash value is still growing uninterrupted as if you hadn't touched it because you didn't, you didn't get the money. The money didn't come from your policy. It's still there growing. The money came from the pool. Uh, and we have to admit that the pool is interested in being repaid with interest. They are uh, a for-profit enterprise after all. And as you mentioned, Amanda, these days they're in the 5% simple interest range. So that's 5% simple interest. And Amanda, you correctly brought that up earlier and how important it is to be charged simple interest all year long and only compounded annually in arrears. So what does that actually mean in plain English? Well, let's say that you chose to repay this loan over four years. Your, your repayment plan was a four-year plan. Your decision, right? You get to decide your repayment. If it took you four years to repay this loan, you'd pay approximately $3,800 of interest, which works out to 1.9% if you do the math there. 3,800 divided by 50 divided by four years is a 1.9% annual percentage rate. Is that a pretty good deal for borrowing money, getting a car loan, Amanda? What do you think? Yeah, I, I mean, I've seen them lower, but I've also seen them way higher, right? Seven and a half percent might be about average depending on your credit score and so forth. Yep, I know you guys have told the story about how you saw a zero, a truly lower interest rate loan on a car. These days, I'm seeing car loans in that six to eight percent range, aren't yeah. you? Yeah. Would you agree? Yeah. yeah. So this is fairly affordable money, but even so, Brandon, to your question, Dave Ramsey would be screaming if mm -hmm. he was watching this right now, hitting his keyboard. They're paying interest on their own money. The car was what? How much was the sticker price? The sticker price says $50,000, but we paid $53,820. Why would we do that? Why would we pay interest on this money? Oh, wait a minute. Where did this interest go? Back to the pool. Who owns this pool? Anybody want to chime in on that? Who owns this pool? Millions of Americans. The policy yeah. owners, the people yeah. that are uh, part of that company's. Um, Including the policyholder in this example. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. We own the pool since we're the mutually owned life insurance company. We own the company that we have a policy with and therefore our interest, plus all the other investment options and bonds mostly and real estate, all of it comes back as portional, um, apportioned dividends to our policies. And, you know, the, the simple example here is not going to be precise. So everyone's returns are going to be a little different, the internal rate of return. But let's just say over the last 50 years, the examples I've seen show whole life insurance doing somewhere in the middle single digit range. So four to 6% over the last 50 years. These days might be a little less with lower interest rates, to, you know, but it could also be a lot higher depending on how long interest rates stay high. But for simple conversation, let's just say that you're getting 5% on this policy money. Again, that's 50 grand earning 5% over how many years? Four years, right? That's about $12,100 in gains. So just to kind of summarize this whole example, and I'll be done because I see our time, we earned 12 grand in our policy. We spent $3,800 to borrow the money out to buy the car. This means our arbitrage, we earned more than we spent $8,300. Now, if we had just paid cash for that car, here's how much we would have. So yeah, which of those two numbers would you guys rather have? Exactly. Yep. Mic drop. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, that so why does this 
fit into our banking crisis and what does this have to do with the banking situation that we find ourselves in? I guess what I'm wondering as I wrap my little thing up there is what if just 10% of Americans did that? What if that's the way they did their banking? You know, I'm not talking about totally removing ourselves from society, going like total raw vegan up in a mountain somewhere. I'm saying if you could just be, bank on yourself, if just one in 10 of us did, what would that do to the problems that we see in the banking world today? What would that do to the Federal Reserve itself? What would it do to FDIC? What do you guys think? What what implications, what are your takeaways from what we've been talking about together today? Yeah, I love um, what Olivia put over on uh, uh, Facebook in response to your question there, safer and happier. That's great. Yeah, thank you, yeah. Olivia, for and commenting that. Brandon, were you going to say oh, that? I was, gonna I was just going to say what, what it would do is just build us to being, again, healthier people and, and being in a place of sanity. And I think that that's the hard part is, is in the banking world is they, they profit off of insanity, off of craziness. Uh, and what we have to do is kind of as our, our, both of our uh, podcast is thinking, uh, smart about our money, you know, thinking about how to be good stewards and maybe, uh, I don't know, wondering how do we, uh, avoid some of this craziness and, and understand it. That's just me. But. Yeah. And I would, if there's any r economist researcher type people out there, I want you to, to look into this more because I want somebody to go back and look at America when half or more of Americans did have whole life insurance and they were using it to pay off their mortgages early or pay for their kids' weddings or buy cars or, you know, all the things that you can use the cash value for. And that was, you know, just 70 years ago or, you know, 100 years. Like it's been in the 20th century that that was true. And if I look back at that time, not having lived during that time, right? I'm, I'm a kid of the 80s, right? I don't remember that time. But when I look back at that time, I'm not seeing the same worry and crisis in, you know, in, in such repeat, right? There's still world wars. There's still the Great Depression during that time. And yet that Great Depression could have been a whole lot worse, pun intended, if there hadn't been whole life insurance and so many Americans using it then. And there we mm -hmm. can look back and there's no reports of anybody with cash value and life insurance losing money during that time. Their cash value still stayed where it was, still continued growing. In fact, we work with companies that were there during that time and they still paid dividends during that time. Like, can you, like, wow. That mind mind blowing. Right? Like, let's yeah. do the analysis. Let's actually dig into that. I want you know the people at you know major you know PhD programs or the economy economists that are creating formulas and trying to predict what the market's going to do over the next thirty years. Let's look back and see what it was, what real Americans are experiencing then, compared to now, and let's see what's changed. And that's probably going to be one of the biggest th things that have changed. Well, and looking back at that and saying, how did this banking thing that's changed over the past, I don't know, 80 years, 40 years, whatever, how has that impacted our health? Again, going back to our initial thing and saying, do we want something different? Uh, and if we want something different, what is it? What do they say? The definition of insanity is doing the same thing and expecting different results. Do we want something different? Do we want a stable foundation in our finances? Uh, being able to use our money in a smart way, uh, as Elon Musk did that whole Twitter thing, right? Maybe I'm not saying he's smart in any of that, but but I'm saying like using our um, equity and our policies to do cool things, not just buy a car, but maybe change the world in a positive way. Um, and maybe that's what we need is more people saying, I'm done with this. I want to build a, a good foundation for myself and change the ripple effect in not just the policies, but in other areas and business and real estate, you know, and take control of that. That's for me, I'm, I'm sick of it. I'm tired of seeing banks and I know it. we're not done with this conversation, but 
um, why don't you wrap us up, I, Mark? I, we got to go now. Uh, I think you. I'll give final word over to the host here, our hostess, uh, Amanda. Okay. Go for well, it. Well, thank you for being here, sharing your wisdom with us, Mark, Brandon, and the people in the chat. Um, the chat's not closed. You can still comment there. If you've got feedback, questions, we would love to still hear them. And if you have topics you want us to talk about in our next lives, please let us know. We would love to talk about them. Um, and we've already changed one financial future. Olivia's planning to make her next car purchase um, and is already thinking about how she can use some of the strategies we talked about today. So thanks for that, Olivia. And we'll see you all next time. All right. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to subscribe and like and share.